Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Wong. I'm the uh, co-chair of the Veterans for Peace China Working Group, and I also serve on the National Board of Directors of Veterans for Peace. Uh, I'm here tonight with uh, George Ku. Uh, George is retired from a global advisory services firm where he advised clients on their China strategies and business operations. He's educated at MIT, the Stevens Institutes, and Santa Clara University. And he's the founder and former managing director of International Strategic Alliances. And he's uh, traveled and done business and been involved in China for quite a long time and knows his subject well. Uh, our subject today that we're going to talk about is the South China Sea and all the various issues and politics involved with that. Um, so George, uh, my first question is, tell us about the history of the South China Sea uh, prior to the colonial uh, modern period. Um, yeah. What was the situation like then? Well, it's a that's an interesting question, Mike. And the answer is, in a way, it's what history? Because until the until the white colonial powers came to Asia, nobody thought about a need to have a history. The Chinese fishermen has known about these islands in South China Sea for maybe a thousand years or more because they would use them to you know, in in times of shelter for bad weather, and, uh, and and then they move on. It's not in the Chinese culture to have to plant a flag somewhere and say that we now own this particular island, whether the people own it or not. So, in 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 point of fact, the uh, I think by now we've all heard about the uh, Admiral Zhenhe who uh, had a huge fleet that sailed around South China Sea as far as Australia and as far as the uh, east coast of uh, Africa. Uh, and he did that seven different times. At, and he was asked to do so by the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, which is in the very beginning of the... Um, 15th century, um, some rumors said that thought that the reason he was so interested in exploring the, the South China Sea at the time is because he usurped, the th he was the son of the founding emperor and he usurped the throne because the um, his father appointed the grandson, his nephew, to be the second emperor and he resented that, and he was the strongest of the princes. Um, and he then came down from Beijing to, to Nanjing, where's the capital, and basically sacked the capital. But they never found the body of the nephew in the fire of the palace. And so he was always concerned about where his, grand, his nephew went. And that was supposedly one of the reasons that uh, he sent Zheng He around. But the other much more important reason is that Zheng He was on a mission to make friends with all the tribal little kingdoms around and um, um, presented them with gifts and encouraged them to go and visit the um, Ming Dynasty emperor. By now, he had moved the capital back to Beijing. Um, and um, and they had a, a tribute system set up such that if you go and pay your tribute to the Ming Emperor, you get much more in return, return gifts. So in a way, that was a um, a, a barter trade system that, that the Ming um, Dynasty set up. Um, and uh, in you know seven different trips. Um, to the point that actually Emma Zhenhe died uh, on the ship on his uh, on his seventh um, voyage. But even more interesting and even less known 
then um, then the story about Zheng He was a general by the name of Huang Huang Shenping. He was a young, very capable um, commandant under the first Ming emperor, the founding uh, emperor of the Ming dynasty. And this emperor asked him to set up as an emissary to visit a, um, a um, kingdom in Brunei to establish a friendly relationship. And so he, this Huang Shenping, he took his family, including his sister and others, and sailed down to Brunei. You know, and in those days, that's a quite a uh, quite a long voyage uh, over open water. He got there. He befriended the local um, tribal leader, and in fact, the tribal leader's brother married his sister, and so then he became part of the the royal family, if you will. And then when the the king died, the brother became the king, and the son born out of the brother and his sister became the successor to the throne. And to this day in Brunei, they still feel that their royalty has Chinese blood in them. Now, that's the kind of history that nobody else knows about. And no, nobody really uh, talks about it um, because, you know, this is um, this is something that happened when China was a kingdom and most of the other places, Vietnam, Philippines, so on and so forth, there, there, there hardly are real organized entity and are not part of the seafaring uh, ongoing uh, exchanges in, in trade, if you will. So that's so that sets the stage what I would call the history, quote unquote, of South China Sea. Okay, thanks, George. Um, let's see, my next question is, what happened during the colonial or modern period uh, with the introduction of imperialism, international maritime law, et cetera, et cetera, when yeah. there was a significant change in the, the state of the world? Okay. Well, as you know, the, um, the first Western sea power that came to this part of the world was the Portuguese, followed by the Spanish, and much later the Dutch, and eventually the Brits, and, and also the French. Now, in those days, they couldn't care less about all these little atolls and islands and whatnot floating in South China Sea. They're looking for gold, they're looking for uh, for wealth to trade with the Chinese because the Chinese had tea, Chinese had um, silk, Chinese had porcelain, Chinese had the goods and the, and that the West wanted. So hardly anybody pay any attention to what's going on in South China Sea other than passing through, you know. And in point of fact, and through World War World War II and beyond, the American uh, movies, uh, war, uh, war documentaries, always show that the South China Sea, the 11 dotted line as part of China. And of course, at that time, China is considered a nationalist government headed by Chiang Kai-shek. So the fact that there was an 11 dotted line around the South China Sea has been around be, even before um, uh, the uh, end of World War II. A very interesting recent uh, development news is that there was a historian from Ireland who had really not too much interest in China so per se, but he was an historian and he went and dis searched the French archive, the UK government archive, and the US archive. And he found evidence in all three places that basically admit that South China Sea was part of China. Of course, 
they while they admit that was the case, they basically say, well, let's not tell the Chinese about it and let's not tell the world about it. Yeah, you know, just keep it to ourselves. So that's pretty much close to where we are today. And the fact that the 11 dotted line became nine dotted line because after PRC took over China and they inherited the 11 dotted line, they negotiated with Vietnam and took away the two dotted line that was between Vietnam and China and just say, okay, let's just let's settle that part up between ourselves. So I think that's where we are today. Great. Yes, I heard of that. I understand that basically they gave the Gulf of Tonkin to uh, Vietnam uh, in that negotiation. Yeah. Uh, but I also heard that because Taiwan, the government on Taiwan, the uh, government that's named the Republic of China was not part of that negotiations that they still claim the 11 dot line is have you heard that well no what happened was um after world war ii uh, the um the uh, you know some of those islands were occupied by by the japanese troops during world war ii and of course at the end of world war ii as part of their condition these unconditional surrender they had to give up Island of Taiwan, they had actually, they actually had to give up Okinawa even, and they um, retreated and gave up some of the possessions on the South China Sea. And one of the larger islands that is actually um, naturally inhabitable, which means it has fresh water, that was actually occupied by the KMT, by the nationalists. And when the nationals retreated to Taiwan, they actually retained possession of that particular uh, island. I think it's called a Taiping Island, and and be, you know, and PRC has not done anything about evicting or or reclaiming or or pushing them off. And so, they still have the the Taiwan flag on that particular island in the South China Sea. Okay, uh, let's go on to our next question, which is, uh, what is the current state of affairs uh, in the South China Sea? It's interesting because Ch South China Sea became an issue because the United States made it an issue. First, they came up with this so-called freedom of navigation. F O N. Well, there was never any question about freedom of navigation. Nobody was restricting anyone from sailing in South China Sea until the United States made it an issue. And in truth of the matter, the U.S. has no role, no possessions, and no rights to the South China Sea. So they had to make up an issue and they make up an issue by saying, hey, we exercise the freedom of navigation and we don't want anybody to threaten us as, I, as we sail our ships up and down South China Sea, including through the Straits of Taiwan between the mainland and Taiwan and so on and so forth. They were trying to make something out of nothing in this case. And then they created an issue by convincing the Philippine government to sue, to have a dispute on some of the islands uh, with China. And they took it to the International Court of Arbitration. Now, the Western media, the popular mainstream media, whether by ignorance or by deliberate intent, try to confuse everything and try to make the International Court of Arbitration as part of the International Criminal Court. There's a big difference between the two organizations. The International Criminal Court was established to prosecute war crimes. The International Court of Arbitration is by that name, is trying to arbitrate disputes 
And one source and reason for the confusion is they have offices. They rent some offices in the International Criminal Court building. So that gives them some um, a false cover, if you will, of legitimacy. Now, in the court of arbitration, you have to have both parties agree to an arbitration before, before you could have a, um, a dispute that's been settled. Well, the U.S. provided, the U.S. government provided the funding for the Filipino government, and this is um, the government that preceded uh, Duterte's government. They convinced the Filipino government to file a claim against China at the court of arbitration, and the Chinese didn't agree to the arbitration. They didn't bother to show up. Because they basically say, South China Sea belonged to us, so why should we even arbitrate something that belonged to us? So, and, and the other thing is they also understand and realize that particular panel on the in the court of arbitration is, is a strong bias against China. You know, the, the, the lead, the lead arbitrator, I think it was a Japanese national at that time. Okay. So, so it didn't surprise anybody when the ruling came down in favor of Philippines, but the Chinese ignored it. The Chinese government, the Beijing government basically ignored it. And when Duterte became president, he basically said, let's just forget about this. I'm not interested in pursuing it. I'd rather work with China to get on the one built, one road um, projects, get into joint and co-development of resources in China to see and see what kind of set, settlement that we can arrive at. And that's how the direction that he was moving before he was turned out. And when Marcos Jr. succeeded him, initially it was with the understanding that he was gonna follow the Duterte line and work with the um, uh, the uh, the Ch Beijing government, and in fact, he paid a visit to Beijing and had a very friendly, positive meeting and wanted to go and talk about how they could cooperate and can take advantage of China's help in the Belt and Road projects. Shortly after he came back from Beijing, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin paid him a visit. And it's not known what Austin said to him or what kind of a deal they struck, but he turned 180 degrees and became anti-China, pro-US, allow all kinds of missile bases to be to be based in Philippines to strengthen the so-called the first island chain that the US has surrounding um, surrounding China. The Philippine people are not in favor of what Marcos is doing. The Marcos's family itself is not in favor of what Marcos Jr. is doing. And of course, Duterte's daughter is the vice president of the Philippines, and she is not in favor. And in fact, some of the uh, pundits has come out and pointed out by, by agreeing to have your... It, the intermediate range missiles based on your land pointing at China. If if there comes a conflict, the first thing that will happen in terms of retaliation from China is to attack where the bases are. And the Filipino people are going to pay a price. Same same strategy all over again that we've seen from Ukraine on. Namely, the U.S. love to get others to do their fighting for them. It's proxy war in the setup. The other thing that should be noted, the International Criminal Court has two countries that never bought into and agreed to be part of the International Criminal Court. You want to know who they are? Sure, go ahead the United States and Israel. 
they are not part of the, they are not, they are consider themselves outside the jurisdiction of international criminal court. This is why you can commit the genocide in, in, in Gaza and not worry and not fear about getting arrested. So, and, and, and the, the, there's another thing, there's a, there's a UN law of the sea that, um, again, it's called the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, unclose. Yeah. And, and the UN, US love to cite how China or anybody else is in violation of unclose. But again, unclose is another one of these UN treaties that the United States did not want any part of and has not signed on. Uh, so this is, I'm, I'm sure glad we had this conversation because we need to clear the air and make sure people understand that the entire crisis, if you will, or tension on South China Sea is primarily created by the United States. Thank you. Let me go on to my next question. Um, and that's my this will be my final question. Yeah. China has proposed a treaty uh, establishing rules of the road yeah. uh, for the South China Sea, uh, uh, forming an agreement with all the, the nations around that area. Could right. you tell us a little bit about that? You know, I'm a little fuzzy uh, myself on w what happened, where it is, because at, at one point, I know that China went around to the ASEAN countries, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, Brunei, and Philippines, and you know all of them with a stake, with a vested interest in, in the South China Sea. And what the discussion, the proposal on the table was to say, why don't we, among ourselves, leave that big elephant out of the room and talk about how we can collaborate and cooperate and share in the resources uh, of South China Sea, you know, joint development and joint share. And it sounded pretty good to, at one point or another, it sounded pretty good to all the principals involved, but somehow or another it hasn't come to a, a, a final treaty. And again, a lot of it has because the United States has kept it from becoming a a, 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 a final concluding deal. And I think um, it's still on the table. And one of these days, it may still get there. Um, you know, I, I, you, you may have heard recently there was a, a poll of ASEAN countries. Uh, it, was, I, it was conducted by, um, by an organization in Singapore. And now the people in the ASEAN countries, more than more people think favorably of China than they think of the United States for the very first time. So I think the 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 way US is dealing with everybody in bad faith is beginning to tell, it's beginning to influence and impact what people think of the US except for maybe possibly uh, the Philippines. And, um, uh, but you know, e eventually, if everybody can see eye to eye, they can jointly develop the South China Sea and share in the benefits of the mineral resources, share in the preservation uh, of, uh, uh, of the, the sea as a, re as a resource, as a marine resource. So that's pretty much where we are on the South China Sea. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate your doing this, George. Um, and we'll certainly have you back on some other time to talk about another subject related to Asia and to China. Thank you. Yeah, okay. That was nice talking to you, Michael. Okay, see you next time. Right, bye. Oops.